Hello, everyone, and welcome to the James Spears Foundation's uh, International Women's Day. Today, we are celebrating Black Women in Beverage, a special event in honor of some of the most talented women in our industry. I'm Melandra Hastick, Central Coordinator of Impact and Finance, and I'm so happy to be welcoming you all this evening. So, a couple things to note. Since last March, the James Beard Foundation has been hosting virtual events and industry support webinars to help navigate the challenges of COVID-19, provide resources for the hospitality industry, and to stay better connected throughout difficult times. But before I introduce our wonderful panelists, here are some quick housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded. We'll post a link to the recording on openforgood.com after the program wraps. If you have any questions for the panelists, please write them down in the using the webinar toolbar. We'll try to address a few questions as time allows. If you're having tough technical difficulties, just message us using the webinar toolbar and we'll do what we can to troubleshoot. My colleague Debbie will be keeping an eye out and we'll be happy to assist. Now, to start off, our moderators are Lashana Daniels, creator of Do It For The Col Cocktail Culture and The Libation Librarian, and Ashley Tuck, founder and editor-in-chief of Will Drink For Travel. Now on to our wonderful panelists, featuring Benny Ashburn, CEO and co-founder of Crowns and Hops Brewing Co., Miriam John Baptiste, co-founder of LS Cream Liqueur, Krishan Lampley, founder of Love Cork Screw, Marvina Robinson, founder and CEO of Beast Stuyvesant Champagne. Now I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, Ashley. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. We're really excited to celebrate International Women's Day with all of you. Um, and uh, yes, we're just so excited. Lashana and I uh, both highlight Black-owned spirits on our pages, and we came together uh, for this amazing idea just to highlight Black-owned spirits together, and it's, it's been an amazing journey and fun process for both of us. Um, so we're just really excited to, to do this tonight. Lashana, did you want to say a few words? Uh, yeah, you know, um... Ashley and I have worked on a couple of different Black Owned Spirit um, seminars, and we're hoping to continue this up because um, we know how important it is that these Black Owned brands get the exposure that they need and deserve in order to elevate their platforms and for more people to know about them. Um, so we are grateful that you all are interested in being here and supporting us, and we can just jump into learning more about these amazing women. Yes. So Miriam, why don't we start with you? Please tell us about yourself and uh, how you got into the spirits industry. So hi everyone, my name is Miriam Jean-Baptiste. Um, I'm actually from Montreal, Canada. Uh, I'm the co-founder of LS Cream Liqueur. We're actually a spirit that's inspired by Haitian cremas. Cremas is a celebratory drink in the Haitian culture. There's, it's always there at baptisms, the first communions, at weddings, anywhere. So. Um, my husband and I, who's also the the, the co-founder of LS, really wondered why we were not able to, you know, have this cremas all year round. That we have to we had to wait for our grandmothers and our aunties to actually go into the kitchen and make it. So being adults, we were like, well, we want to drink it now. So how are we supposed to get it? So we really looked into it. Uh, we started doing our research went uh you know the the usual route we're not from the alcohol industry where we were two uh corporate business uh, people so um we did a research started seeing that it is something that it's in demand and we really wanted to fill a gap everybody has a bottle of baileys at their house well right now uh, there's an alternative there's a black owned alternative in the spirits industry that's called ellis cream and it is very delicious. And we decided to just launch. And we've been, we actually started in the States, but came back afterwards uh, in Quebec. And we're in over 200 locations of the SAQ, which is the government run um, like distribu distributors, I guess. 
And uh, we're also available in uh, Florida, in New York, in Jersey, and uh, soon in other states, and online also in uh, over 33 states. So that's uh, awesome. And uh, LS Cream was like heavy in my holiday rotation and makes such <laughs> like, great cocktails around that time of year. Um, well, so thank you, Miriam. Thank uh, you. Hello guys. Yes, owner of Love Corkscrew. I started the industry actually 25 years ago. I've been the owner of Love Corkscrew going on 10 years. Uh, I started winemaking. I am classified in the industry as a negociant, a winemaker, and no, I do not make wine in my bathtub. I actually source <laughs> from different vineyards and I do my own custom crush blends. Again, in the industry forever. Um, but I worked on the distribution side uh, and I also owned an art bar, uh, bar and gallery side. So I got in the industry because we actually won Chicago's Best as the best wine list in 2009. And I wrote that list. And then working on the distribution side, I knew it was missing. People want to support small batch, small local wines. Uh, and also they wanted wines that were just fun. It wasn't about serious wines all the time. It was a $130 billion industry. There's different wine drinkers. Uh, and a lot cannot pronounce Bordeaux, Chianti, and Chenin Blanc and could care less too. So I wanted to make sure my labels were fun and whimsical. So I came up with double entendres. Uh, and it hit the market again eight years ago, over 500,000 bottles sold. I'm in the likes of Walmart, Target, Whole Foods, Cost Plus World Market, Myers, Total Wines and Spirit, you name it. Uh, Love Corkscrew has grown from just an Illinois brand to now um, almost all states that are we be hitting in the next month or two. So a huge growth for Love Corkscrew and thanks for having me here on this awesome day. It's a pleasure to be in the, the uh, presence with some, some great women. Awesome, thank you so much, Krishan. And what are you drinking tonight? I forgot to ask Miriam, I'm drinking a margarita made with Antiel tequila. It's a black owned tequila out of uh, Michigan. Miriam, what are you drinking? I'm on my own supply, so I'm drinking some Ellis <laughs> cream. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm definitely drinking Love Corkscrew. We're moving on up, Cabernet Sauvignon. Yum. Uh, Marvina, let's move on to you. Tell us how you got into the spirits industry. Hi, good evening, everybody. I am Marvina Robinson. So I am the founder and CEO of V Styrus and Champagne. How I got into the industry was uh, total whimsical, a big 360 for me, for myself. I've worked on Wall Street for over 20 years. I am a champagne lover from early legal years. Um, and I decided I would open up a champagne bar, which is Coupet NYC. One thing I wanted to be unique to the industry, specifically here, because I'm based in New York, it is a bar establishment on every other block. I wanted to have a house blend and I wanted my house blend to be my own champagne brand. So that's where it really started at. So I had to venture to France, uh, to find a vineyard to actually work with me to bring my vision to life. You know, it can only be called Champagne if it's from the Champagne region of France. With COVID, you know, as I was going through the process, I didn't share a lot with people, certain people I would share here and there. And then people began to keep asking me to put the bottle on shelves. And I'm like, oh no, it's for the bar, it's for the bar. But then I'm, you know, speaking with my attorney, he was like, well, what's the problem if it goes on a shelf? You know, the bar isn't open yet. And then COVID came and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm not gonna sign a lease right now. And I put it on the shelves and it actually did, started doing uh, well, you know, beyond my beliefs. We currently uh, sell um, strictly online um, through our e-commerce store, which is um, shipping by Vino Shipper. We are about to release to retail going into April, May. Uh, we have two signature cuvées, which is the Grand Reserve, which is actually what I'm drinking tonight. I'm getting high off my own supply. Um, and we have our rosé. We we have introduced for our rosé, we have it in half bottles, full bottles, and also magnum bottles. Grand Reserve is regular status, standard bottles, magnums, and we're introducing demi sac uh, blanc de blancs we have a heritage which is a limited edition which will be com coming on board full portfolio and two additionals going towards the end of the year um so like i said i stumbled into this industry i've officially resigned from wall street and i am now in the wine industry here to stay make an impact make further connections amongst other beautiful women and you know find my way 
Awesome. And I follow you on Instagram. So I know you do pop ups like in DC and Baltimore. So next time you come, I am all over. We're, your coming, first, we're coming up. I'm actually going to post it on Friday, but we're coming back this uh, in May and we're actually adding on some tasting classes in Baltimore. How, how wonderful for me. <laughs> um, and last but <laughs> not least, but Benny. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Benny Ashburn. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Crowns and Hops Brewing Company. We're the first Black-owned brewing company out of Inglewood, uh, California. And um, I, I myself stumbled into this industry, um, me and my business partner, T.O. Hunter, about six, seven years ago, noticed, noticed a huge void in diversity uh, inside of the craft beer space. Uh, for me, I fell in love with the community and the culture of craft. Um, there's a lot of curated experiences and curated spaces if you ever go to a brewery where you see um, people having real family moments and intimate conversations and gatherings in a really safe space. And we noticed that these spaces did not have us. It didn't reflect us. We didn't see ourselves. Um, but we are very familiar with beer culture as it's been marketed to us throughout um, the years. But um, as black women, we do have a strong presence in the fermentation process. We do have a strong presence in the brewing of beer. Um, so we took it upon ourselves to really create this brand focused on changing the narrative around the craft beer industry. Um, today, we are in about 300 plus stores in Southern and Northern California where uh, we have some distro in London. We're in the process of distributing to Japan um, and some other uh, overseas regions, finally making it over to the East Coast. And hopefully by this summer, we'll have our tap room open and by next year have our own um, production facility, which is very exciting. Um, I am drinking our, um, our Italian Pilsner, Miles to Italy, which is a tribute uh, to Miles Davis and his contribution to um, culture. So cheers, ladies. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for cheers. having me. Cheers. cheers. And Crowns and Hops, you guys have the most beautiful cans. I mean, the artwork is outstanding. Thank you. It's It was important to us to really create art that you immediately felt your reflection in them without necessarily screaming from the rooftops. We're a Black-owned business. It's not always just about that. It's about culture and it's about representation. Well stated. That actually brings us yeah. to our next question, and I'm going to throw it to Lashana. Yes, and I also realized I didn't mention what I was drinking tonight. Um, so I do it for the cocktail culture. We like to tell Black history in celebratory ways. And one of those ways is through um, highlighting historical Black figures through cocktails. So for Women's History Month, I wanted to honor um, Black female chemist Alice Ball. So I made the Alice Ball cocktail that we made inspired by her story. So if you want to learn more about her story, I posted it in our stories on Instagram. So um, that is at For the Cocktail Culture. You can learn more about how she impacted um, the science industry and created the most effective, effective treatment for leprosy that the 20th century had ever seen. But enough about that. I want to get back to you, ladies. So um, something that I'm always um, interested in knowing more about is how do you ladies feel about being um, described as a uh, BIPOC, uh, Black-owned brand? Do you feel like there is a stigma attached to it? As well as, um, how do you feel about um, being Black-owned versus Black ownership? Um, do you feel like you have to be 100% Black-owned in order to be considered a Black-owned brand? Or what are those requirements for you all? So um, we can start with uh, Marvina. I would like to hear your intake on that. So. When I when I talk about my brand, and this actually was started, this actually came out in the beginning, you know, black owned woman owns champagne brand. And one of the questions I got asked in one interview for is, is my audience, well, my consumers to be strictly black women or black people? And I and my answer was no, you know, it, it, my answer is being black and a woman describes myself, right? So it's not my brand. You know, it describes me, who I am. So I'm a woman, I'm black, and I'm bringing a new product to the consumer industry. I specifically do not have a target of who my consumer should be. If you love champagne, then you are my target consumer. If you do not like champagne, I want to educate you about champagne. And it's up to you if you like it or you don't like it, because everybody has a unique palette, excuse me. 
on our Instagram page, I always discuss different learning learning topics about champagne. I just don't really push the brand. I t I, my, my, one of my models is we sip it, let's learn about it, right? I talk about different things where let's cook with champagne. You know, I also do things like called champagne champagne culture. It's a really wide industry, so I, that's what how I like to look at it. Um, do I do what I do want to point out is I do want to say that it is an underrepresented industry. You know, I, like I said before, I worked in Wall Street, another underrepresented industry. So it is good to know that you have people, women like us, and also men as well, that work in these industries that are not populated by us. Um, so I think that's important. I don't think that that I don't think that should carry the brand. I think it's the quality that should carry the brand. Um, that's one of my things I, I would say. How I like to be described or do you have to be black owned as far as 51% or 49%? To be honest, I've actually never really thought about that. Um, I think um, when, it's, when, when you're describing a brand, if it is, let's say, not fully owned by a black person, then it's, it's a 50-50 um, ownership and it should be described depending on where it's being utilized that. So that's my take on that. Okay, thank you for that. Very insightful. And I love that you also show your customers how to use your products. I think that's very important for people to understand. And I don't think a lot of people do that. Like you can cook with champagne. That's fun. That's a great way to utilize the product in a way that you wouldn't have thought of. Uh, so Benny, can you also give us your insight on that question? Um, absolutely. So Tio and I led with being a black owned craft beer brand um, because honestly, it, they just they did they didn't exist at the at the level that uh, was enough to sort of galvanize the community. I mean, we honestly started with our shirts, black people love beer, <laughs> which turned into a movement and a calling card that was something that you could wear when you went to the brewery and you were the only one, or you go to a beer festival and you're the only one. It was almost like wearing a HBCU shirt or something that automatically identifies you and puts you in this collective community of people who understand what craft beer is and, and what, what you know those flavor profiles um, are. So we've always led with it. And I think because we've led with it, along with, to Marvina's point, uh, quality. Um, I think we've been able to sort of lead the charge in terms of, of, of the Black conversation in the craft beer space. Um, in terms of the percentage of ownership, um, we recently did a grant called Atrio Pills, where we gave away $100,000 to five Black-owned craft beer brands. And that was a question we had to ask ourselves when we were writing the, um, the, the rules is what does being black owned mean? And does that eliminate anyone? And it, you know, we came to the conclusion that yeah, 51% black owned means you are owned by a person who considers themselves to be, to be black. And I think in doing that, it, it allowed for companies that are black owned to lead because there are a lot of partnerships where black, owned, black owners have maybe like 10% or 5%, but they're not driving the conversation. They're not making executive decisions. And we wanted to give the opportunity to people who are making the final, who have the final say and how they drive culture and how they change industries. So I think it's very relative to, to every industry, but um, I think it is important that we start taking that ownership back. It is 51% ownership in some cases um, that really changes these industries. So thank you for that um, insight and that perspective. And I appreciate you, you know, making it real and concrete for us with your initiative that you were doing, you know, and I am grateful for your perspective. So uh, Krishan, I would like to hear your perspective on these questions. Um, de definitely love corkscrews for everyone. Um, I always wanted it to be for everyone. Uh, and it definitely is more focused on uh, wine enthusiasts and wine novices alike. So it's definitely no color to that. But at the same time, the opportunities that are allotted to us come from being, or lack thereof opportunities, come there from being a Black-owned black, a black owned business. So that being said, when it comes to business, uh, I'm 90% owned Black woman, 100% owned Black people, as far as my company is concerned. Um, I have decided through the years that I will definitely remain at least 51% because I am a minority business enterprise. So 
certification legally, I have to be. Um, and I don't plan on changing that. Um, now, it being said, as far as marketing is concerned, I will never hide who I am. I am a black woman and proud of it. But at the same time, what I know in being in sales and marketing in this industry for so long is that it's the power of the share. I want people to share that. I don't have to scream it. There's no need for that. What's needed to happen is love corkscrew needs to be everywhere. And that's period in everyone's hand, no matter what color they are. It has no religion and it has no politics attached to it. I do not scream anything but enjoy. Indulgence knows no boundaries. So at the end of the day, opportunity and business um, almost force feed you. Um, to, to be a certain way, um, whether it be, again, opportunity, whether you are, whether you are pigeonholed to not get opportunity because you're a Black woman. And that's when I scream, stop it. Stop it. Uh, that's when I scream, I'm going to break every glass ceiling till there's no more to be broken and say, Black woman, hear me roar. Yeah, there's only 60 of us out of 111,000 in the world that are negotiants, wineries, or vineyard owners. 60. So a lot of times I have to scream that to certain opportunities, whether it be big box stores, whether it be distributor relationships to say, yo, come on now, you're, you're purposely doing what you're doing or you're ignoring me, even though I'm the same exact entity as they are, you're asking me 20 more questions more than you're asking my white counterpart. That's when I have to say there's a problem. And that's when I scream that's the problem. So I don't want to get too, uh, <laughs> too, too into it, but um, it's it's sometimes you're you're forced um, in that direction, but I want everyone to enjoy my wine. I want everyone to love love Quirk's Group. Yes, and I thank you for that insight. And I do want to revisit that because um, you know I can imagine all of you ladies have probably experienced your own levels of pushbacks or. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how to categorize it. Do we want to say racist or do we want to say discrimination? What we want to call it, but we know that it's there. And, you know, I want to hear more about that. But I also want to hear Miriam, um, your perspective on the question as well. For us, it's absolutely important to say that we're black owned. Uh, I mean, we we did LS Cream because we saw that there was a gap in the market. Like I said a bit before, uh, everybody has, let's say, Bailey's or Rum Chata uh, at their house but it doesn't necessarily resembled us. So we, we, we just wanted to do something that really was targeted to our community, our demographic, but for sure, I mean, like everyone, we want it to be available to, to any community, to, to each and every one of, uh, of us, but it's really important for us, not only because, I mean, it's important to put our culture forward, but also because it's important to educate. So by saying that we're black owned, even I am now that I make purchases, I make sure, you know, I'm more conscious of where I put my dollar, right? So I think it's really just a, a, a way that you could uh, identify your, your product and say that, it, okay, yes, it, it is black owned, but it doesn't mean that it's only for black people, right? And being from, uh, from Quebec here, we're actually, you know, it's run by the liquor board, right? So we're the, actually the only black owned product on the shelves of the SEQ right now. And this is huge for us, you know, it's, we, we're, we're paving the way. So yes, we want to say that we're black owned because there's a lot of people, I mean, we get DMs and emails uh, every week saying like, how did you guys get into the SEQ? How did you guys get into the States? Because it is, you know, something that is, is, is big. So that's why it's really important for us, yes, to be successful. But at the same time, I think it's important also to help your community and pave the way. So yes, we do put it put it forward because it's it's I think it's necessary, especially in the um, social context that we're in right now. Um, but yeah, available for everyone. It is for everyone, but we're proudly black owned, and uh, we put it forward. Thank you for that. And I also love the insight that you gave about how um, you are the only black owned liquor product in Montreal or in Canada. In Quebec right now, Quebec. on the shelves of the SEQ, yeah. That is an amazing accomplishment, but also a bittersweet, like how did it take this long for this to happen? <laughs> Absolutely, and people are scared and there's so many barriers to get into the SEQ here in Quebec. You don't know how much like, well, you probably know ladies because you know, you're know you all entrepreneurs, but we had to fight. <laughs> 
like really hard to 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 be there and to stay there. So it's it's a mission for us. That's uh it's it's basically that a mission for us. Yeah, that is um an amazing insight into your story. And you know, um just to move on, um Ashley, so do you have some questions for yourself for these ladies? Yeah, um it is International Women's Day, um as I mentioned earlier. Um and you guys are in an industry that's typically um, white male dominated, um, which none of you are. Um, so, you know, what is the, the your woman's touch? Like, what do you feel like you bring to your brand and your industry that you don't feel like a man in your shoes, white or black, could could fill? And I guess we can start with you, Benny. Mm -hmm. Yes, my industry is very white male, <laughs> male dominated. Um, and, it, and it's funny when you when you talk about international, the, the first people to ever invest in our business was a Scottish based brewery. We couldn't even get anyone from actually America to invest uh, to help us. So uh, it's it's funny that uh, today is International Women's Day because we've been, uh, been able to be uh, international to a certain extent. Um, I think I think I bring a, a level of, um, I think it, it's just a certain level of, of attention to detail. And I don't know if that's because I'm necessarily a woman, even though we can all claim women pay clearly more attention to details than men do. Um, but I think that's also just my experience um, and kind of what I've done before. I used to produ produce TV commercials for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so, you know, I was sort of trained in noticing the little things and making sure the little things felt good and they were beautiful and the stories were being told and it made sense. And I think probably with all of us, um, we used our past career experience to be able to finally build for ourselves versus always building for someone else. Um, so I think, you know, for me personally, it's that it's that perfectionism. It's that super attention to detail and that um, tenacity that I just think as a black woman, um, I just am innately born with, or we're all just innately born with. Um, so I think that is definitely something special that we add to these industries that they're not used to maybe seeing. Yes, a little sprinkle of black girl magic. I love it. Um, Everywhere we go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Krishan, what about you? I, I would say what I bring uh, different to the table is that I am the brand. So I am Love Corkscrew. Uh, some people don't even know my name and they say Love Corkscrew uh, or they say the wine lady. Uh, so it's definitely the story uh, behind that that no one can give other than me. But above and beyond that, it's bigger than me. Uh, it's way past me when I'm gone, when I'm dead and gone, people are going to remember Love Corkscrew for inspiring others to do it and making an industry that doesn't look like them. Um, and that's what I can bring that a white male can't bring to that industry um, is, is the story. Uh, and again, it's, it's above and beyond. And not only the story, but that it's a story that transcends and in, goes into homes in many different ways. You know, for a lot of people, Hard Knock Life, me, uh, my, one of my Concord labels means Jay-Z. For others, for me, it meant Annie, because I was trained classical pianist and always wanted to be Annie in musicals. So there's different things that, that transcend with Love Corkscrew um, that no one can do but my own and myself as a woman with my story and my journey. And I think that's what we all do in anything we're in. It has nothing even to do with this industry, right? It has to do with what you're passionate about or your passion that follows you. Um, and it is about what you bring to it to make others love it as much as you do. So I am love quirks too, so nobody can do that. <laughs> I think you bring up an interesting point though, and to sort of circle back to the earlier question about being a black owned brand, um, you know, people have this idea about what it is, what it means to be a black owned brand when it's like, we're not a monolith. Like we all have different interests. We all bring different experiences, different backgrounds, perspectives to uh, whatever we do. Um, in your guys' case, uh, your businesses. Um, but yeah, it's like you can't take you can't take our stories from us, and that is absolutely um, what I see in each of your brands um, separately um, as a consumer. So thank you for that, Krishan. And what about you, uh, Miriam? 
because you uh, actually run your business with your husband. So what is it that you bring that, you know, he perhaps doesn't? Yeah, let's say that let's say that we know our roles and we know where to stop and begin. But um, I think for us, it's really, uh, you know, m men tend to have an ego, right? Um, whereas, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to build relationships with with people, I guess. But um, for me, it's like if I need something, I'll go straight to you and I'll ask you for it, or you know, I I'm going to build that relationship. Whereas uh, for my husband sometimes i think it's more um you know they have to go over their ego to to either ask for help or get something that they they want so i think this is really a a strong point that you know we manage to to you know share our roles um in that sense so if ever we need to you know to build something to build a relationship or something i'm mostly the one that will take care of it and reach out to someone or things like that so i think also, you know, being a, a woman, uh, being a mother as well, I think it's, uh, we're, we're naturally nurturing and all of that. So I'm always asking, okay, how are your family? How's your family? How's this, all that? So we're just, you know, it's a sense, I think, of uh, familiarity, uh, if I could say. So yeah, I think that would be, uh, that would be it. Thank you. And Marvina, and also, we're a little more than halfway through the hour, uh, but if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat so we can get to them. Uh, but we definitely want to hear from you guys, so please put them in the chat. Um, so, sorry, Marina. Um, I would say for me specifically in my brand, Be Stylist, that I bring relatability. Um, when most people think about champagne, they think about snobbish, they think about luxury, they think about not being able to afford it. And, or some people put like, it's not, it's only for celebratory occasions. And that's where I, I I say no, right? I talk about like, as a woman and as a, as a black woman, we can drink champagne, we can talk about it, we can sip it. My friends and I used to chip in by Moet White Star um, out of a plastic cup and fight over who had more. And, and those are just the story. That's like where the story is. And as Rashawn was stating, it's about I am the brand. Like, am I the creative of, of champagne? Absolutely not, nor do I claim to be. No, that's not my fame. What I am is bringing something that I love and desire and creating a brand that that's mine. And then I wanna share with the world. What I also wanna do is, as far as relatability is, as women, and I'm not just saying it's only women, but as a woman, we cook, right? So let's talk about how we could bring this into our um, into our kitchens. You know, some people like we did. A, I did a cooking show with champagne. Like we had um, uh, champagne infused French toast. You know, but you have people that didn't realize that we can do this and how the difference in the taste taste is. And that's where I sometimes think that a man or a, you know cannot bring to to the brand or or uniqueness can bring it. So I also say I bring my personality. Um, the good side of the personality because I'm a shark on one side, but then I'm also that fun person that likes to entertain. And I feel like, okay, we can, you know, that's what I want to bring to to my brand. And so I want people to see that. And that's what I try to leave with. Like when we do post on our social media pages, I don't run the page by myself, but I try to convey to other people of my staff, like this is what the vision of the brand is. It's easy to post those pretty nice pictures. But for me, I want people to see real people with the products. What do we do with the products? Again, as I said before, let's learn about it. Because sometimes when you go to other pages, let's say for a champagne, which you know I've looked at other pages, they don't really talk about like different pairings or you know as we come up to different holidays, how can we pair it? Or what are alternatives? Like let's say you don't like champagne, let's have a champagne cocktail. You know, so just different ways that you can you can utilize champagne in other ways, which I say is, you know, it, I'm, I'm relatable and I'm also unique um, as we all are. So that's what I try to bring to the brand. That's what I think that somebody, a man cannot bring to this, to my brand specifically. Awesome. And as you were talking, I was thinking like, I would love some champagne French toast with Marvina in champagne, learning about <laughs> champagne with Marvina. So I feel like you need to make that happen. I can't make well when listen, I, I can't even get back out there right now. Trust me. So as soon as them travel restrictions yeah. I am like <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah, please make that happen. Lashana. 
So the one thing that I love that I heard from all of you women is the creativity, you know, the creativity, where it's recipes or Benny with like the merchandise and letting people know that we bear this on us and Kashan, your labels and your puns and Miriam, you know, bringing something um, unique to the market that people don't necessarily know about. Um, so, you know, I loved all of your stories, especially like Krishan, you talking about the extra screening that you had to endure as a black owned, female owned um, brand. And then Miriam also with your extra hurdles of the regulations. So Marvina, I wanted to know if you had any um, hurdles or even triumphs maybe that you've experienced in your journey with building your brand. Oh uh, yeah, somebody, a vineyard actually wanted to work with me. <laughs> So, you know, like when I ventured to France, I had no, ex I had no plan. You know, I just knew like I wasn't going to be in New York right now. I knew like where I needed to go to. And I said that my first connection really started a drunken night at five o'clock in the morning. I was talking to another gentleman who's opening a bar in Congo and he asked what I want for my brand. I said, I wanted a house brand of champagne. So he gave me the introduction of one, one vineyard, right? But all I need is, all I, I always say, you just got to crack the door for me. I can do the rest. Once you crack it, I could do, I mean, I can open the door myself too, but you know, you crack it, I'll take you the rest. And I, I just wandered around, you know, without in the regions, looking at different venues, talking to different people, listening to different referrals. Some people didn't want to work with you. And one thing I did have a problem with is find, finding vendors so I can fully customize my bottles. So I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say when I first launched the brand a little bit over a year ago, I could not afford to do custom corks or the cups, custom capsules, because it really wasn't in my budget. I funded my business myself. I don't have any investors, no bank loans. It's just the money I had in my account. And I decided to take the risk on me because I'll always risk on myself. You know, house don't lose. That's how I say. Um, and what I did was I couldn't afford to do those things. And when I was trying to, they were giving me such difficult difficulties in which they had to say, oh, the minimum is 50,000. I'm looking like, it's no, it's not 50,000, you know, you're not, you're not, I don't have to buy 50,000 to do this. I'm sure you can lower it to 10,000 or such and such for me to get these things. And they wouldn't do it. Like from the corks, from the cast, from the capsules to the wires, to the, um, to the 10 caps, like the most less, I couldn't get it because I was, it was so high. And I was like, do I put my money in there or do I put my money in the actual product and just go generic? And that's the initial route that I took. I just went generic with like whatever, um, whatever corks I could get or whatever generic capsules or foils I can get. That's what I used initially. And I'm okay. I was okay with that though. I know I wanted more, but I wasn't going to hold up my brand to get there. Fast forward. Now I'm able to afford it, but guess what? Now those numbers aren't so high, right? So I had to prove myself a little bit to show such and such. Now, I guess I'm being petty. Some people I don't want to do business with because some people wasn't thinking about me when I was really trying. So I'm a loyal person. You do right by me, I do right by you. So people who kind of shun me, and you know when you get in shunned, I didn't revert back to them, right? But some people came back to me. I, you know, like people find their own ways, they find their own knowledge. And I'm I will never say anything. I'll just pretend I didn't see the email, right? So I'm <laughs> like, oh, bypass. But you know, so as as I, I do got the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> like so, I'm busy. I'm busy. Right? <laughs> but the people who, you know, the people that work with you when I'm trying was trying to grow the brand, I am as loyal as it comes. And another problem I had one time, and this was a gentleman who actually worked on one of the vineyards I was dealing with. He was, I would say, um, he was downright disgusting by emails. He was degrading and he would take his shots. And I try to be professional first, right? Because Marvina Marvina is like, who the bleep, 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 So I took it a couple of times, but then I said, oh, you know what? It's enough is enough. Um, and I had to check. So I had to professionally chin check him in an email. And when I did that is when he kind of like got it together, only this much, but then we had to go down facts. And once we went down the facts and he was wrong 200%, I haven't seen him on another email train yet. So sometimes I don't, I don't, you know, like those are things I have to go through. I've went through and I still have my own trials and tribulations right now, but I just take, you know, I take the good, the bad and the ugly. And I, and I, I live by this. What's meant for me will always be for me. I don't go above and beyond. Well, I do go above, I do go above and beyond, but I don't 
I don't believe in like doing too, too, too much. I don't hate on other people's brands. Like if I have information that can help you, I'm, I'm all good with saying, hey. Now, one thing that I probably don't do is I don't have a playbook. So therefore I can't share a playbook with you. I can just share my experience with you. And you just have to be thick skinned because as we are all in an industry that is not populated by women and by black women, period, or by black individuals, period, you have to be thick skinned and be ready to pivot to different tables. And if one person is blocking you, all right, you hold that blockage right there. Let me go to the other side of the court and let me get my layup because it, where there's a will, there's a way. So I am resourceful. I'm that person where I don't accept no. You can tell me no, but I'm gonna find another way. It might take me a little bit more time. I gotta dribble a little bit slower, but I'm gonna get there. And then when I get there, it's a great feeling because I, one, I'm not selling myself out. Number two, you know, I'm I'm there. And there was, you're never, you're always gonna have a, a, a trial and tribulation. So I say, okay, hey, over one blocker, let's go, let's move to the next. So that's what, you know, things I've encountered. And I'm sure there will be other things I have to encounter. And I'll just do what I do with the rest one day at a time. That's all you can do is take it day by day. So, you know, thank you for that insight. And I totally understand. I think even anyone in business, you know, especially if you're new coming out, you kind of have to prove yourself in some way, but let people know that they also can't just do whatever because you're a new business. Um, so Benny, I would love to hear your perspective on some hurdles you may have. I, I mean, you did mention not getting any um, American um, help, which is wild to me like like that's really wild so i want to know more about why and also if there's anything else um i think over the years there there's been a lot of hurdles i mean even to this day we're still in the process of, of raising capital to open up our production facility even with us having products in so many stores and sort of proving the model of success i still think there's still a, a level of of you know misunderstanding of of what it is to be a craft beer business when there really aren't a lot of black craft beer brands at all. I think Krishan, you said 60, 60 apparently seems to be the number because it's about 60 black owned craft beer <laughs> black owned craft beer brands um, right now, which is less than one percent. But I think similar to what Marvina said, there every time someone tells me no, it's almost like you're asking me to do it. So you know yeah okay i can't do it great and then you go teach yourself how to do it and then you make it happen and you show everyone that it can be done um so i think the traditional entrepreneurship hurdles and obstacles particularly as it comes to finances have just sort of been a part of our story but um with every obstacle we've just found another opportunity with covid we've found another pivot um you know we could have been in a position where we would have had a brewery open and we'd like to believe that we were able to pivot to packaging, which we probably wouldn't have been able to do um, had we gotten the money sooner. So I am a firm believer of everything happens for a reason and everything happens in the time and the season that it's supposed to happen. So through all of this um, work we've done to get us here, it has forced us to learn so much more about this business, which it gives us back a lot more of the control that we would have not had if we would have gotten the investment money a little bit sooner so you know i think there's power in the struggle because you come out significantly stronger on the other side of it um i think an amazing success which was something that recently happened um for uh women's history month whole foods was uh featured me in their stores uh, part of the women's maker series and you know i cried because to see a, a black woman uh with a full body shot in Whole Foods with a short buzz cut and neon nails and red lipstick and a little leather skirt talking about craft beer queen, but that's who I am. And, you know, I think everyone has said that uh, intrinsically they've been their most authentic self as they lead the brand, they are the brand. And I think what I didn't mention is I bring to craft beer color and not just brown skin, but I bring color to an industry where uh, women don't usually put on makeup or get their hair, do their hair. That's a very uh, labor intensive industry. Um, but my first brew day, I wore a skirt because that's just who I am and that's what I wanted to do. And I think that's who I've continued to be. And I've opened up the doors for other women in beer that you do not have to dumb it down because you're in a brewery with a bunch of men. That doesn't even make any sense to me. You could still wear lashes. You can still do all the things you need to do and handle your business and be just as professional, but you can bring yourself 
to the industry and to the table in a way that no one else can see it. And all it does is inspire others to do the same. So um, with every with every loss is, I think, a greater win. And I think all of us here are proof of that because this, I know I don't think we're allowed to curse, but this ish is not easy. <laughs> but no, we it's all- not. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm sure we, we all have- We all have, we're all getting uh, there and we are, we're gonna get there and we're do, all doing a phenomenal job. So cheers to you ladies. Yes. You're right. That's right. Cheers to these women. So um, Ashley and I, though, we wanted to also get into some of the audience's questions. So Ashley, do you have one ready for us? I do. Oh. Um, sorry, I can't see who. Oh, Linda Peterson asks, as a budding entrepreneur, the stresses of starting a new business can at times be overwhelming, and it is compounded by these unprecedented times we live in. Please share what each of you do to stay grounded, focused, and also to incorporate self-care. And I guess let's start with you, Krishan. Oh, wow. Uh, to stay grounded and focused, I think because I, I was a comeback kid and I've lost everything before, um, I'm probably one of the oldest ones here, and I definitely lost everything during that 2008 market crash. Um, um, so I've, I've been through this type of thing before. Now, I'm not gonna say it was this bad, obviously, but it was bad. If you were in real estate during that time, if you were in the hospitality that time, we lost everything. Uh, so the, the and, and Benny mentioned it, and I think sometimes you guys hear it a lot, but it's true that you really do have to pivot. You have no choice, right? I always say, when my, if my heart's still beating, then I have a purpose. So if I'm still here, I better keep going, right? Why sit and cryo and sulk over it? So what, does anybody really care? No. So it's up to you <laughs> to do something uh, with your situation. Um, so I think as a small business, when, when I mentor, and I mentor a lot of young entrepreneurs, and I always tell them, don't ask me, and I, I say it with the utmost love, don't ask me where to find things when you can Google. I didn't have Google when I was younger. I couldn't do that. You guys have so much. And between the grants that are out there, are you kidding me? There's so much free money. It's not even funny right now for small businesses to learn. And I'm not talking about PPP loans. I'm talking about there's WSET course scholarships left and right from Napa Academy to you name it. So there's so many opportunities to educate yourself, to get better and do better and be better. So don't hold on to your model because you always look at your business plan as something you can change several times. I've changed my model several times based on the times we live in. So if you can do that and really keep it as a working document, that's what I tell business owners to do. Whether you, it's a pitch deck, whether it's a VC packet, whether it's a business plan, learn to pivot in the time you're in instead of sulking and being sad on your loss. I've lost it all, almost got kicked out of my home. Now I'm national with a brand. Are you kidding me? So you got to keep going and, and keep pivoting and know that there is a purpose for you. And so on the flip side, one more thing. Sometimes you got to let things go. Mm -hmm. Maybe that wasn't for you. There was a couple of businesses that wasn't for me and I let it go and my passion found me. So just, just know you got to keep it moving. Your heart still beating. Nobody's worried about how sad you are. Keep it moving. <laughs> man up <laughs> got to and i say it with love i say it with love keep going don't I stop never settle keep going my goodness what about you Miriam? do you have any i'm so i i agree with you i mean it's um you know we're actually in our seventh year of business and this is right now just now that we're starting to get some yeses so i mean if it, I mean, I could have, you know, just abandoned or, you know, went back to my corporate job a few, uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, but I think, you know, just to keep pushing, to know exactly your worth, to know your product, to believe in it, but no matter if your family, because I mean, as entrepreneurs, you get a lot of pushback from your family. I was like, you know, making a very good salary at my previous job and, uh, you know, living well and, even my family was like, are you really going to let that go to pursue a dream or to sell that liquor? Are you serious? Like you have all this security, but you're going to, you know, 
you don't know what's going to come in next but if you truly believe in what you're you're you created and you you have faith in your person and i mean to be resourceful as well is such an important thing uh to surround yourself also with a you know if you're able to actually to, to surround yourself with a team if you're not able to do it yourself delegate i mean don't be afraid to ask for for advice i think that's one of the things that yes it's hard to do in the beginning but when i really like i was vulnerable and i was you know i i, I really opened up myself and you know reach out when i needed help and continue to push and and believe in my product this is really when barriers started to fall and oh my god okay i'm it's going up it's going up it's going up so i think just not giving up is it's i and i know it's not easy to do like it's something that's really hard to do but you really have to believe and at one point somebody something's got to give if you work hard something's got to give at the end of the day so just keep on pushing and believe in yourselves would be my advice thank you I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, what other roles or aspects of the beverage business would you like to see more women in? Can you repeat that question? Sure. What other roles or aspects of the beverage business would you like to see more women in? And let's start with you, Marvina. I would say distribution. Yes. Distribution has been uh, hard and I initially pulled everything and I said, you know, I, I'm not going to distribution. I'm okay with, you know, our e-commerce store. Vino Shipper has been good to me. Um, I've just now opening up to distribution only because it's been a demand from consumers. It's been a demand from different retailers. And you know what's so funny? This retailer accused me of discrimination. I'm looking like, what am I discriminating against if nobody has it but the online store? Like, so where are you coming for this? And then I started getting requests from international. I'm like, you know what, let's just, let me just prep so that I can grow because there's other things that I want to do. So I would love to see more women on the, on the distribution side, because that I think a woman's touch is needed. So mm -hmm. I definitely would love to see more women on the distribution side. I thought Benny, we a women owned retail company. I did. <laughs> yeah. If I could chime in uh, specifically on the sales side, because right now we, as we work with our distributors who also have salespeople, we need to hire our own sales team. And there are very few sales black women who are really pushing our products in these retailers, retail stores. Like I would love to see another Benny on the sales side, doing all the same things I do on my side, committed to making sure our products are refreshed on shelves. And they're, do, you know, they're, they're ringing up like they're supposed to, and they're delivering against all the promises they said they would deliver on the retail side. And um, they know what stores to go to, what neighborhoods to go to, how do we connect to our consumers in a better and more engaging way? What do our consumers want to see inside these, these retailer spaces and, and point of sales? I think right now it doesn't really exist. Everything's so traditional and it's it's so templatized for products that don't necessarily speak to our culture. And we, we um, receive information differently. We look at products differently. We interact in stores differently. Um, so if we had more people that look like us, to really sell our products as part of this sort of 360 supply chain, I think we would do significantly better. Um, and we wouldn't have to be playing every role in our own businesses to to fill those voids. So I gotta very Any quickly say law. Women listening, please yeah. get on board, please. Anybody listening? <laughs> um, definitely law. Law, law, law. Um, there, there, I went to so many black uh, lawyers, black women lawyers, and I could not find not one that knew the license that I wanted 12 years ago. Um, it was very simple as far as federally licensed as an importer, exporter that they could not do. Everyone wanted to give me a catering liquor license or you can't, you actually have to have a four walls that end up being absolutely false. Um, and it saddened me because I was like, take my money but give me the right thing that I need, like here, please help. So I would say law, um, liquor law is very specific. There are tons of lawyers that have no idea how it works. And there's lawyers in liquor law because it's ever changing, they get confused. Um, so I would say, give me a black woman in law that knows about liquor and we're gonna give you tons of money. Believe you me. I when love you find it. her for her, over, it's over here. 
Real quick, so I can like help all your man. There's so much money to be made there because that license is key. You can't do anything without license. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but you have champagne. You're fine. <laughs> Lashana. Yes. Yeah, so you know we're almost um, wrapping up right now, but we are really interested in knowing just from each of you ladies, like a quick soundbite of what are some exciting things that you have coming up for people to look out for. And we can start with you, Miriam. Well, I, I can't really talk about it right now, but uh, we have an exciting partnership that we'll announce soon. So that's very exciting for us. Um, Ooh. Ooh. Like, uh, yes, maybe a new flavor of LS also maybe but uh everything will roll out during the summer so we're very very excited so stay tuned guys love it and krishan what about you um national the fact that we got a national distribution deal with uh two of the largest distributors in the entire country uh so that was huge for us so see, you're going to see love course you go from I'm now in 600 locations to about 3,000 in a matter of weeks. Uh, so very excited about that. And I just want to thank Myers and I want to thank Total Wines and more. Um, and the great thing about it, a lot of these national buyers are women. Um, so for these women to reach out and literally look up Black woman wine and bloop, here's Love Corkscrew. For them to reach out um, was absolutely amazing. So women power, big time. And, and I, I look for Love Corkscrew to be uh, national. That is fabulous and congratulations. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, Marvina, what about you? Um, for people who are local, we are opening up our champagne garden coming into June. Um, so that'll be like a nice, um, nice event. It's a nice intimate event where we can talk more about champagne, you know, ambiance. So we're beginning to build that out. Globally, I do have two projects that I'm working on. Can't fully disclose all the details, but one will be released with within the next week and a half, as long as every all the other vendors are on board to produce what I need produced. I have a larger project I'm working towards within the next three months. And we have like, you know, two limited editions rolling out towards the end of the year. And my personal goal as COVID evolves is to actually open up Coupet NYC, which is a champagne bar. Um, we'll feature Stuyvesant Champagne, but also other small grower champagnes that a lot of people do not know about or sparkless because i do like a cremant that people are not aware of that i've, I've discovered in france that i want to bring here so people can expand their knowledge and palate so those are things that i'm working on so that's I all love... <laughs> well yeah of course we always gotta at this point we just gotta be ready for anything it feels like and i'm gonna but... write the content because i'm gonna need benny's beer in my spot too and everybody. Yeah, okay, and we're all gonna be I was about to say my bar right now does not have any one of y'all on it, and I'm gonna need to change it ASAP. Um, what do we have? So most recently, and I am extremely proud of this particular beer for Women's History Month, and I don't know if you can really see it. We created a can that oh, features so cool. beautiful black women. Um, and this is a beautiful piece of art done artwork done by Kay uh, Kiki Kitty. It's part of her. A collection as part of our artist series, but I think I'm pretty positive this is the first craft beer can I've ever seen with black women on it. Come on. In now. a way that actually reflects how beautiful we are versus, you know, a derogatory image of us. This is us in our in our most uh, freeing light. This art piece is called Black Joy for all the obvious reasons, um, and features every shape, size color and beauty of the black woman so we're very proud of this this just came out um and then lastly we released our hbcu ipa which is very exciting i don't know if there's any hbcu yes. um, alumni this i'm assuming right here good. nice okay this is what i'm saying so this is the first hbcu ipa i think ever on the market and this is for all the obvious reasons to pay tribute to all the amazing HBCU alumni um, in the world. But we have so many beers dropping and by this summer, our hope is we have our beer garden and by next year, we will have our production space up and running. So we are coming for you. Yes. Yes, New Very York, sorry. LA, Champagne. I can't wait. I can't wait to visit yes. everyone. And I'm Mary to be drunk from there. state to state. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget Canada, please. Don't forget Canada. Nah, I'm traveling to all of y'all when we can. <laughs> 
Do a national <laughs> tour. This is the posse right here. The fly. Yeah. Posse. <laughs> right, hop into one another. Let's do it. Let's do it. Together. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us. This was so fun. I feel like I learned a lot about each of your stories, each of your brands. This is amazing. Um, Lashana, did you have any closing words? You know, I am so excited to hear about all of the things you ladies are doing. I look forward to following, to see how you grow, how you progress. And if anyone has questions for the ladies, I'm sure they would love it if you reached out to them. You know, um, I know our social media handles have been listed in the um, slides. Um, but if anyone um, wants to go through and just say their handles one more time before we head out, um, Miriam, your Instagram handle? Yeah, so Alice Cream Liqueur and my personal one is Miriam GB, but you can reach me, you can reach me at either of. And Benny? Uh, yes, it is crowns and hops with an S on both, and then Benny Ashburn as well, my personal. Marina? Um, I just forgot for a minute. Um, the bubble. <laughs> bubble. Uh, <laughs> that is a campaign for our Instagram and Facebook. My personal one, because I always like to connect with people, is Marvina underscore, underscore Robinson. Krishan? And mine simply love corkscrew. No matter what, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, I am love corkscrew. Awesome. Nice. Thank you, guys. We're going to toss it back to Melandra. I think she had some closing words for us. Yes, what a wonderful way to start off Women's History Month. Uh, this was such an empowering conversation. We, on behalf of the James Beard Foundation, we truly, truly um, thank you for bringing this conversation um, to our platform and just looking at the wonderful talent here. I want to buy everything like now, like I feel like I know so much more now about the beverage community. And I think it's so important that we're having these conversations and we um, just wanna thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Lashana. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Krishan, Marvina and Benny. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful Women's History Month. And the audience, thank you for tuning in with us. We appreciate all the love and support. Um, please learn more at openforgood.com. Um, please support Black and, the Black and Indigenous American restaurants um, by donating at jamesbeard.org slash investment dash fund. Um, and thank you so much, everyone. Thank we'll you for you having us. Thank, thank, thank you for having us hosting. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Oh, you close this? <laughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs>